China is a country which is slowly emerging from a troubled politically turbulent past to become one of the world's major industrial producers. In 1949, as China settled down after the seemingly interminable Sino-Japanese War, World War II and its own civil war, the newly installed government, led by Chairman Mao Zedong, realized that a giant leap forward in providing an industrial base was needed. And a prerequisite for this was efficient transport. The enormous distances involved meant that the only practical solution was railway, and almost limitless coal reserves meant that the railway would be largely steam-powered. An ambitious program of new lines, modernization and improvement was begun in the early 50s and is still continuing. China is in the grip of railway mania. In a country with a rapidly developing industrial and commercial economy and without roads outside major centers and where few people own anything with more than two wheels, the demand for both passenger and freight transport is enormous. Naturally enough, Beijing Station is the starting point and finishing point for hundreds of thousands of rail journeys each year. Although plenty of coal is one reason for using steam, lack of technical know-how and high capital costs are also relevant factors. A new QJ-2102 costs one-tenth the price of a new diesel locomotive. The Chinese have got steam loco maintenance and quick turnarounds down to a fine art, such as the volume of rail-borne traffic. 90% of mainline steam trains are worked by the mighty QJs. And in this part of world steam today, a loco is a QJ unless stated otherwise. That being said, this JS class 282 number 8278 is acting as works pilot at Baotou's China Rail Depot. The sight and sound of steam hauled 2,000 ton freights at 15 minute headways is staggering to Western enthusiasts, especially when one realizes that many locos are almost brand new or but a few years old. Most Chinese locos have air horns as well as steam whistles, and one can be forgiven for thinking there's a diesel coming the other way. Many lines will eventually be electrified with steam working until the day the juice is switched on. But this scheme on the Bayan Obo line north of Baotou seems to have been abandoned, as the poles have been there for some years. This loco is JS Class 282, number 8001, on yet another freight train. The relatively small number of loco classes in use means that in China one can indulge in the simple art of train watching. In this part of the program, everything you see is filmed as it happens, with no chartered freights, stage management or laid on smoke effects. It's very definitely the real thing. Indeed, it's as real as you can get in the 1990s.
Fortunately, locomotives do use their steam whistles sometimes. A steam train is often the only means of public transport for distances longer than those covered by cycle or local bus. Here, another JS class 282 departs from a halt near Bauto Depot with a stopping train. Once the passenger train has gone, the apparently endless procession of QJ Hall freights begins again. Soft-class travel provides an acceptable level of comfort for the long distances involved, with the attention of a stewardess. On long journeys, as well as the catering crew, on-train staff may well include an electrician, a carpenter and plumber to keep the equipment in working order. But for the majority of Chinese people, the basic hard-class accommodation is the norm. Steam still handles many long-distance passenger trains, though gradients of line occupation mean that speeds are not remarkable. It's easy to think of a steam railway as outmoded and old-fashioned, but China's rail infrastructure is modern and well-equipped, with heavy rail, quality engineering and contemporary colour light signalling. And in the closing years of this century, China's railway engineers aim to complete 1,200 miles of new line every year to help cope with the projected doubling of China's railborne passenger and freight traffic. Another practice rarely seen in the West is that of blowing down, where tubes are cleaned out on the move to improve steaming. 
This spectacular process is necessitated by poor quality water and is normally carried out at specified locations where high pressure steam jets can be safely deployed. This QJ has one smoke deflector missing, for reasons unknown, but this minor inconvenience is clearly not enough to keep the loco out of traffic. Thank <laughs> you. 
Many locations have small servicing facilities with two or more strategically positioned water columns where trains can pause for a quick drink or fire clean out. Rail staff are on hand to do the necessary. The QJ is the Chinese standard and was still in production at Dartong Works until 1988, having been introduced in 1957. It uses cylinders, coupled wheels and valve gear derived from the Soviet LV class. The QJ also uses a Russian pattern of box pock driving wheels, a Worthington type feed water heater and a Delta trailing truck. And although many freights are double-headed, there are times when two engines just aren't enough.
These dumped locos of various classes were called a museum by the Chinese guides. But these brand new SY282s bearing 1993 builders plates were also seen, believed destined for use in a nearby steelworks. Just how long Chinese steam will remain in quantity must be open to conjecture, and there is no doubt that steam traction is, slowly but surely, on the way out. Although Japan is usually associated with railways of speed, World Steam today has time for a brief look at just some of the steam operations to be found in these remarkable and photogenic islands. Standard gauge in Japan is 3 feet 6 inches, and the national network, which includes some private railways, moves millions of people each working day with frighteningly high levels of punctuality. But at weekends, the vast fleets of electric units take a break and on many lines, some of Japan's numerous preserved steam locomotives are permitted to run. Western enthusiasts rarely visit Japanese soil, due largely to worries about cost, diet, language and culture. But the rewards are high for those who venture there. Here, a preserved C-57 class Pacific arrives at Tsuwano, one of Japan's oldest towns. Class leader C-571 has two claims to fame. She was restored after a dramatic encounter with a landslide in the early 60s and once pulled the Japanese royal train for Emperor and Empress Hirohito. The Japanese have more rail fans per head of population than any other industrialized nation. And there were many Japanese train watchers at the line side long before the works of the Reverend Audrey became globally popular. Japanese mainline engines rely heavily on standardization, and many classes look similar at first glance. The C-57 is a heavier type Pacific used mainly on stopping and semi-fast passenger services. As in so many countries, the 462 wheel arrangement was the mainstay of passenger locomotives right until the end. The circular, front-mounted headboard denotes a named express, of which Japan had many, particularly overnight expresses from Tokyo. C57 number one now lives Tsuwano on a return trip to Oguri. This loco was one of Japan's first mainline engines to be restored and she has been pulling excursion trains since 1979. In the early 70s, as workaday steam was dying, the Japanese National Railways embarked on a well-conceived plan of preservation that included the Umekoya Roundhouse Museum in Kyoto, a modern facility full of newly rebuilt locomotives of the major classes that would be available for many years to power excursions. And those responsible clearly appreciate that one live locomotive is worth any number of dead ones, and one engine is steamed every day for demonstration purposes. Some knowledge of railway heritage is clearly regarded as an important part of every child's education. C612 is one of 33 C61 464s, which together with 47 C60s and 49 of the awesome C62s gave Japan 129 Hudson types in total 
which bore the brunt of the heaviest and fastest steam assignments. But there are some steam surprises in store. The museum at Meiji Mura is a cultural open-air museum which uses both steam locos and trams to transport visitors around its extensive site. Steam power is, of all things, a 120-year-old Manchester-built Sharp Stewart tank, although there are other engines here too. The line is less than a mile in length and the loco is religiously turned after each trip. There's no bunker first running here. The Oigawa Railway is a typical private operation, with steam runs at weekends in the tourist season. This private line was the forerunner of Japanese mainline steam operations. The combination of fine mountain scenery and steam locomotion demonstrates its universal appeal. The not unattractive C11 class 264 tanks once totaled 381 being used for similar work to a BR standard 264 tank at home. Mr. Kiyohira Satao is one of Japan's leading railway photographers. Today he's pointing his cameras at a C-58 mixed traffic 262 on the Chichuba Railway, part of the Eastern Japanese system. Their steam haul, Paleo Express, runs every Sunday during the spring. Mr. Sato's train-chasing vehicle is equipped with an at-a-glance timetable and a railway clock. As he explains his hobby, it is apparent that the fascination of steam can cross all political and cultural frontiers. Fortunately, uh, the Japanese uh, railways more or less are uh, very punctual. So we got the right timetable and uh, got a, a detailed map. Uh, we can have... Uh, more good shot of the pictures uh, of the railway. As well as uh, English people, we Japanese enthusiasts also feel like an uh, uh, animal, or say the human beings with uh, breathing. So the why they are so, so fascinating, or the, uh, the like attractive, maybe no words to express if we see them in, the, in steam or in the operation.
The phasing out of steam in the land of the rising sun presented a quandary for the Japanese, who are both efficiency orientated yet sentimental. As development advanced towards an ever more ultra-modern technology-based economy, it was clear that there was no place for steam to earn its living. As steam died, huge colour posters decorated public buildings and shop windows, and high-quality postcards and railway books were available everywhere. Even shopping bags bore images and mighty Hudsons with the legend C-62, Japan's greatest steam locomotive. And as you can see, the C-58s were quite impressive too. The mountainous nature of this route means an electric loco is added at the rear for extra traction and braking when necessary. C-58 number 363 was built in 1944 and restored in the mid-80s, again after over 10 years of being crawled upon by children at a local primary school. Japanese stations with their characteristic high platforms are like their locomotives, functional. And their locomotives are like their motor cars, simple, uncomplicated, easy to maintain and reliable. Such niceties as articulation, multiple cylinders, compounding and inaccessible parts are unknown on home-built locomotives. But the universal electronic level crossing warning bleepers, effective though they may be, have a high irritation factor. The construction and export of two 15-inch gauge locos for Japan by the Lake District's Ravenglass and Eskdale Railway was well documented in the British railway press. Cumbria was the second such loco built in 1992. The Blue Pacific Ernest W. Twining once ran on the Fairbourne Railway, and Northern Rock II is identical to her English twin right down to the livery. The locos work the so-called Romney Railway through the Shishenji Rainbow Village, a sort of permanent garden festival. The line links two villages said to be built in English and Canadian styles. As the guidebook says, English-made 15-inch gauge steam loco gets you on board between English and Canadian village. Ninji no Sato is a new type of park where heart of peace and imagination 
is taken great care of with wealthy nature and pleasant experience. And who could put it better than that? At Amberoa in central Java, a 3-foot 6-inch gauge rack line stretches into the central mountain range. Five of these German-built 042 rack tanks dating from the early 1900s are based here. The first few miles are worked by adhesion, but at Jambu the engine runs round to the rear of the train in readiness for the steep rack section ahead. The necessity for hand sanding a rack locomotive is not clear, but it does add to the undisputed charm of the railways of Indonesia. Although the Dutch built 3 foot 6 inch gauge trunk system is now dieselized. We turn now to the industrial railways of Java where a considerable variety of steam power is still at work. This is the 3 foot 6 inch gauge Chepu Forestry Railway, where the Schwarzkopf 010 tank of 1928 helps to run the 150 kilometer network, serving various loading sites. The coach is for a visiting party of enthusiasts. Teak trees are felled when they are about 80 years old and are replaced by young saplings. Logs are moved to the trackside by ox and loaded with muscle power, aided by some musical inspiration and teamwork. <laughs> But it is the sugar industry which provides most work for steam in Java, although activity is seasonal. Locomotives mainly burn bagasse, a sugar cane residue, which must be carried in large quantities due to its low calorific value. There are many kilometers of interconnecting 700 millimeter gauge lines, and roadside stretches like this one are typical. The locos are 1913 Henschel, and the sugar cane wagons are, somewhat confusingly, known as lorries. Cutting and loading is done manually, and temporary track is often used to enable empties to be manhandled nearer to the cutting area. Steam power comes into its own to deliver cut cane to the mill.
Most locos are German in origin, like this Orestein and Koppel 080 tank of 1922. The tender is necessary to carry the large quantities of the gas needed for the day's work to be done. This is a young 040 well tank. While this is a similar loco built by Schwarzkopf in 1931. Hand sanding is often necessary to assist with the movement of heavy loads of cane. Sludge from the refining process is often moved away from the mill by rail. Here, loco number one, a Borsig 042 tank of 1907, marshals side tipping sludge wagons prior to working them away from the mill to the dumping area. A diesel interloper can be seen in the background. On the neighbouring island of Sumatra, palm oil plantations rely on steam railways to meet their transport needs. Here, number 75, an 0440 Malay tank from Ducro and Bronze, dating from 1927, heads a single coach for a visiting party at the Bajambi plantation. Locos on the plantations burn shangan, a palm oil nut residue which provides a clean and economical loco fuel. The strange looking palm oil nuts are brought to the railhead by tractor for onward transport by rail. Number 98 is one of the largest locos in Sumatra. She's an Orestein Koppel 010 Lutamola of 1938. Only the centre three driving wheels are connected by rods. To give a degree of articulation to the long wheelbase, the outer drivers are connected by flexible internal gearing. The mill itself has an internal 600mm gauge network. Here, two Mafai 060 tanks of 1925 manoeuvre oil nuts towards the steaming ovens. The removable wagon bodies have been removed from their 700mm gauge underframes and placed on the narrower gauge frames for the final part of their journey. The wagons are propelled slowly towards the steaming ovens, which is the first stage of the refining process. The finished product is loaded into tanks for onward shipment to a mainline railhead, again behind steam. Number 38, another Orestein and Koppel 010 
heads a loaded tank train away from the mill. Steam has all but ended since these pictures were recorded, with road transport now taking charge. Australia, the world's fifth largest continent, is well over 2,500 miles wide and over 1,500 miles from north to south. Australia's first railway used human convicts to haul visitors to a penal colony, but now rail transport provides the backbone of freight transport over vast distances and often inhospitable terrain. Differences in track gauge have always been the bugbear of Australian rail operations. But first, we take a look at the narrow gauge. Number 8A is one of six surviving NA-class Baldwin-designed 2 foot 6 inch gauge 262 tanks. She's a very powerful, no-nonsense narrow gauge engine. The class appeared from Newport workshops between 1898 and 1915, although the first two were built by Baldwins themselves in Philadelphia. In the 1880s, low-cost railways were needed to open up sparsely populated but potentially rich areas of the state. Four narrow gauge lines were built altogether and survived until the late 1950s. Four years later, part of the Ferntree Gully Gembrot line was proudly reopened for tourist business using NA-class locomotives. Connecting at Belgrave out of the Melbourne suburban network and marketed under the name of the Puffing Billy, the line is claimed to be the real thing. Though catering very much for family requirements, the line does use original locomotives and coaching stock. Now listen to the Baldwin bark as number 8A tackles the steep and sinuous route through the Dandenong Mountains east of Melbourne. Menzies Creek is roughly halfway, where passengers can break their journey for a lakeside stroll, visit the narrow gauge steam museum, or take a few quick photos. After that, it's more hard work through the forest towards the terminus at Lakeside.
like many preserved lines the world over. Puffing Billy is in the process of extending as funds and resources become available. We wish it every success. Although the neighbouring states of Victoria and South Australia share a common broad gauge of 5 feet 3, the standardisation of the Melbourne Adelaide Main Line is scheduled to take place in the very near future. In May 1994, three days of steam activity brought South Australian Railways Pacific No. 621 Duke of Edinburgh into the state of Victoria to team up with Victorian Railways locomotives working out from Melbourne. Here, the double-headed train arrives at Nil in Victoria for overnight stabling. The next morning, number 621, coupled to Victorian Railways R-Class 464, number 671, heads east from Nil through the central Victorian Wheatlands towards Horsham. This is the first time a South Australian steam locomotive has ever worked east into Victoria, and the imminent gauge conversion means that it will also be the last. Here, the pair arrive at the country town of Horsham for refreshment and photographs. The town's residents greet the steam interloper with as much enthusiasm as if it were the Duke of Edinburgh personally. Both locomotives make an enthusiastic departure from Mertoa. As well as locomotives from both states, the train has a mixture of coaches from both railways as well, plus an additional open wagon tagged to the rear. The excursion draws into Stowell, where passengers will alight for the obligatory barbecue lunch, as much a part of Australian steam specials as the locomotives themselves.
The undulating nature of the route across the wheat fields is very typical of Australian railways and of central Victoria in particular. The pair are seen here racing between Ararat and Beaufort. The very British style station at Beaufort is soon to lose its already sparse passenger service as part of the regaging programme. And if mainline steam should ever pass this way again, it'll be a standard gauge locomotive, probably from New South Wales. In that magical evening light that only Australia can provide, both locomotives do their best to outpace traffic on the adjacent Western Highway. Once at Ballarat, the light is even better. This magnificent signal gantry, out of use pending modernisation, still spans the tracks. As does this train shed, signal box and conventional crossing gates. All the best in British railway tradition. But the diesel is a 1952 built General Motors B-Class Coco, a thoroughbred American machine in all but builder's licence and the double-ended streamlined cab which is unique to Victorian railways. The sun doesn't always shine in Australia and a damp morning works wonders for the smoke effects. The locos have been switched round and the R-Class now leads. She's one of 70 Glasgow-built machines delivered from North British between 1951 and 54. The R's were never really allowed to show their full potential, as they were relegated to secondary lines from day one, due to simultaneous delivery of B-class diesels. While the R is turned, the Duke shunts coaches at Bacchus Marsh. Four of the R-Class survive, two for specials, one in Melbourne's Newport Museum and one, another static example, at Bendigo.
While all this shunting is going on, the connecting special from Melbourne Spencer Street station is en route behind K-Class 280 number K183. The K-Class were a highly successful lightweight mixed traffic loco, the first ten of which emerged from Newport workshops in 1922. The design was so successful that construction continued until 1946, when over 50 were available for traffic. The tour then splits, with R761 taking her train over the secondary route from Ballarat to Maryborough, rare trackage for a steam special. After turning at Maryborough, the big 464 heads back towards Ararat. Australian secondary lines look much like main lines, except that the undulations are more noticeable. The other half of the train arrives back at Ararat from the west behind number 621, running tender first. In rapidly fading light, the Victorian Railway's R and K class locos now head their own stock back to Melbourne and their base at Newport. The next morning, the Duke begins the long trek back to Adelaide. Believe it or not, this is the village of Great Western, and the train is passing under Brunel Street Bridge. At Dimboola, there's time for some photos and a check over the engine. She's one of ten light Pacifics which emerged from South Australian Railway's Islington workshops in Adelaide in 1938. She worked mainly the Adelaide area suburban services and secondary passenger services on branch lines, though in practice could be found all over the system. Withdrawal of the class was complete by 1969 and only one other example survives. 
stuffed and mounted in Adelaide's Mile End Museum. Number 621 is now back on home rails, having passed off the Victorian Railways network at Border Town. This is home territory for this class, and number 621 will have passed this way many times previously, both before and after preservation. But once the gauge conversion process is complete, she'll have to find somewhere else to stretch her unusual Baker valve gear. As dusk falls, number 621 still has over 100 kilometres to run as she crosses the Murray Bridge over the river of the same name. Gauge conversion must mean an uncertain future, not only for 621, but also for the broad gauge lines of Victoria and South Australia. So we come to the end of this celebration of world steam in the 1990s. Within this five-part series, we have travelled around the globe, witnessing steam action from a wide and representative selection of locomotives, from the smallest industrial tank to the world's largest steam giants, all demonstrating that the age of steam lives on.